um, and it is Andy Dibbon um, who's going to talk about establishing agroforestry within horticultural cropping at Abbey Home Farm. Um, and Abbey Home Farm is 600 acres and Andy is the head grower there and about three years ago he started growing trees among um, six hectares of uh, organic vegetables and he's going to talk to us a little bit about that. Andy you're very welcome. Hi there, yeah, thank you for having me. Pleasure to come and uh, chat to you about it. Um, so I'll just get out my, uh, share my screen quickly. Thank you. Um, so. There we go. Okay, so yeah, I'm going to talk to you. Yeah, again, thank you for having me. It's a real pleasure to come and share um, information with farmers, especially about a subject, passionate about the subject, and it's always good to share information. Um, I'm going to talk to you about just the whole process we went through at the farm here in... Um, sort of conceiving, planning, and then um, delivering and planting up. You got me there? Yes, yes, we're good. Yes, we okay. can hear you. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, uh, uh, delivering and sort of just, yeah, getting going with agroforestry on the farm. Uh, and unlike a lot of yesterday's chats, this is about horticultural cropping, uh, specifically um, organic horticulture. So, uh, a little bit of background about the farm where I work and um, also a bit of background on my, where my passion for trees came from. So I work for a business called the Organic Farm Shop, uh, Abbey Home Farm. Uh, we're in Gloucestershire um, and uh, we're just outside Sirencester. So we're about an hour northeast of Bristol um, and we're a 660, 660 hectare farm, um, certified organic for 30 years. Um, I joined the farm seven years ago. Uh, the farm's aim is to provide the local community with a one-stop shop for all locally and organically produced crops for 12 months of the year. Dairy, meat, uh, bread, vegetables, soft fruit, all produced, processed, sold and eaten on site through our cafe and our farm shop. I'm employed as a head grower. Um, we, I'm responsible for six hectares of horticultural cropping. Uh, we grow over 80 different crop lines of fruit and veg. Um, we deliver this through a field scale operation, uh, intensive market garden operation, protected cropping, including a glass house and polytunnels. And it's all staffed by my fantastic team of apprentices that uh, they join me on a rolling basis over three years and we train them in all of the above. Um, we reckon we feed around about 800 people a week with all their daily nutritional needs. So. Um, I haven't always been a veg farmer. I actually started my working life uh, in this office. So this was the first office I ever worked in and it's a beautiful office and you might wonder how I made that my office. Well, that was because I started off as a coppice worker. So um, I spent most of my sort of early adult life deep and deep in the dark ancient woodlands, um, felling hazel and alder coppice, making traditional charcoal, doing hedge laying and uh, supplying thatches quite a lot and fences quite a lot as well. Um, I progressed from coppice work into, uh, I grew up on a sheep farm and it wasn't a surprise I ended up as a shepherd. Uh, I also farmed beef cattle and pigs for a while, um, but I eventually ended up in horticulture, uh, organic horticulture, just as a tractor driver to start with. But slowly I really, really developed my passion for plants, you know, it started with trees, but then got really into vegetable production and sort of progressed through the ranks and became a head grower. Uh, and it was sort of on this journey to becoming a head grower that I came across shots of photos of farms more and more like this. And so I was fascinated to see that there was a, an opportunity to sort of um, combine my passion for vegetable production with my previous passion for trees. And these are all sort of old, quite well-established systems. Um, one of them is a tropical setup, but the rest are all UK setups, you know, and they're all very different approach, but they always, they all show a way of mixing um, kind of two-dimensional ground-based food production with the three-dimensional uh, tree production as well, whether that be for edible crops or for um, just for the benefits of having the trees around. Um, so I've, I'm a job in farmer. I've worked on three or four different organic veg farms. Um, I ended up at Abbey Home Farm, which is a, it's a very well-established organic farm. Like I said, 30 years old. They'd actually looked at bringing in agroforestry a few times, mainly on the arable side of uh, the farm. Um, when I arrived, and my, I got a particular passion for trees. So with, the, uh, with my new employers, it didn't take long before my passion for trees, their previous sort of uh, interest in agroforestry, really decided us to focus our minds and actually get on with 
getting some trees in the ground. So once we decided we definitely wanted to do it, the first stage of the journey really was to work out, you know, it's a big investment putting in trees. So one of the first things we needed to do was to work out if there was any funding to support agroforestry. So we had a look about at the time, um, this, this is four or five years ago, uh, the Woodland Trust were offering specific agroforestry grants um, through a project. It's actually a global project and I'm not sure if you can access this in Ireland actually. It's a global project called the PUR project funded by Accor Hotels. Uh, I think it's a, a part, of an off, part of an offset scheme. But the grant essentially would pay for all of the trees and all of the protection. It wouldn't cover labour and upkeep, but it would definitely cover that initial investment for putting in the trees and keeping them protected. Initial chats with the Woodland Trust around rough ideas that we had were um, very encouraging. So we, um, we started putting together a detailed proposal. Uh, this was necessary for the grant, but also it was very, very useful for focusing our mind on actually the real nuts and bolts and details of how the trees uh, and why we would plant the trees, what we'd hope to get out of them. Um, so yeah, and th this is where it gets interesting because obviously there's lots of different reasons for planting trees on your farm. Uh, lots discussed yesterday around livestock production and the benefits to livestock. Um, there is a whole wealth of um, benefits and competitive elements to um, planting trees in and around veg crops. Um, and I'm going to talk to you a lot about those generally, but also the ones we were specifically interested in now. Um, I mean, the big subject that is talked about in the UK at the moment around agroforestry really, really is the main subject matter is adapting to climate change. So in the 15 years that I've been an organic veg grower, I have experienced uh, negatively all four of these situations. So in fact, today it was minus five here this morning um, and all my apple trees, all my plum trees, they're all out in blossom. Now the frost just about left the blossom untouched, but that's a lot of potential crop I could have lost there. Um, the potatoes down in the bottom left, I have had potato fields look like that and had significant impact from flooding at the wrong times of years on potatoes. Um, bottom right, so droughts are now an annual occurrence in the UK. The last three growing seasons, we've had at least eight weeks of no rainfall at all. And the worrying thing for veg production is these droughts are becoming earlier and earlier in the year. Uh, it used to be if we got drought conditions, it'd be in July, early August. Now we're starting to get, and we're going into one right now in the UK, we are starting to get drought conditions in April when plants are very, very young, they've got very, very small rooting systems. And this is a major challenge. And the one that is always, in fact, out of all the climate change we're experiencing, and it tends to be all the different forms of weather, just in much greater extremes, the one that drives me absolutely mad and it defines everything I do these days, and it has been the same on the last three farms I worked on, is the top right-hand picture, and that is wind. You know, there's a big field of maize being flattened by wind there. Now, wind defines a lot of what I do. The farm I currently work on is up on the Cotswolds, uh, and we are, yeah, it's, it's a very, very windy site. So I'm not sure if you can see top right-hand corner of this picture, there's a wind turbine. Now, you don't put wind turbines where there isn't any wind. So just behind that wind time, over that uh, wind turbine, over that hedge is where my veg production is, and that's where we look to put in um, our agroforestry. And the major, my initial first real interest in introducing trees into our vegetable cropping was all about wind. And these are some of the things we were hoping, or we, we knew through doing our research, that we could, um, we could definitely deal with the wind through planting trees. And these are some of the benefits of doing that. Once established, um, trees will significantly reduce wind in cropping areas, leading to better yields and higher quality produce. You know, in organic um, veg production and fruit production, visual quality is really, really hard to achieve and really, really important. You know, when you're competing against chemically uh, grown vegetables, which have got an almost perfect, perfect visual present presentation, you know, us maintaining high visual presentation is really important and wind is a, is a big problem for that. 
Reducing wind would lead to reduced water loss through evaporation, so reduced water need for irrigation. Uh, an increasing issue in the UK is lack of water for irrigation. Reducing wind in cropping areas will also raise temperatures in cropping areas, leading to increased yields and earlier crops. Crops will also benefit from the nutrients being recycled from depth by the tree roots. And also the increased soil health also greatly helps with um, infiltration of water when we get extreme flooding events. Um, so yeah, the, our main reason, this is the number one reason I even got interested in, in agroforestry really, was the horticultural benefits it would bring to my crops. And that's before we even start thinking about end product of the trees. So end product of the trees, really we wanted to do, we wanted to increase our range of crops and reduce bought in inputs. It's a big part of our ethos here at the farm is to be as close to the agricultural system as possible and strive to be as self-sufficient as possible. It, it tends to be a big aim for organic farms generally, but it really is for us. Um, and there's some key areas where introducing agroforestry is going to help us to achieve the same. And the two end products that we kind of we honed in on and we really wanted to base the system around, one was edible crops. So top fruit mainly, apples, pears and plums. We've got a very busy farm shop and a busy cafe and we currently, we produce a tiny amount of apples before we put in the agroforestry. Uh, we actually use around about 100 kilos of apples, we sell 100 kilos of apples a week. So yeah, that was the sort of figures we were looking to replace and um, cut out that, that uh, expense of buying in apples. Um, the other thing we buy in a lot of still is propagation compost. We propagate all our crops from seed on site and that involves around about 3,000 pounds worth of propagating compost a year. Um, we actually, because we've got a massive arable setup at the farm, that actually uses all of the farmyard manure produced by the livestock side of the farm. So all the fertility in the veg production is all done from cover crops, mainly clovers, but other things in there as well. Um, so we, we identified that producing wood chip would do two things. So we, we, we could replace our propagation compost with composted wood chip. And there's another thing that's becoming more and more talked about in the UK, and that's the use of ramule wood chip. Um, which we apply straight to our cover crops to boost soil fertility. But I'm going to talk about that a little more later in the presentation. So yeah, end products, we were looking at edible top fruit and we were looking at wood chip. Next benefits, so wildlife benefits, massive passion of mine this is. So trees are a critical wildlife habitat and managing wildlife positively is a major part of the organic philosophy. Abbey Home Farms always prided itself in sharing the land with wildlife, not forcing it out. In particular, perhaps more so than any other form of production, organic horticulture, there are loads of really competitive benefits to encouraging wildlife into cropping areas. And trees are a fantastic way of doing this. You know, they provide um, habitat around their base. They provide habitat underground around their root systems and they provide habitat up, up in their branches as well. And the key um, wildlife we were, we were looking to encourage all the time, but even more so with trees, we've got birds of prey. So, you know, rabbits, uh, small mammals, they're all a problem in organic veg production. Seeing kestrels over the fields, fantastic, but they're always having to fly off to the hedges to have a rest. So by bringing trees into the cropping areas, this is going to give them you know, they could rest right in amongst the crops and keep their eyes out for rabbits. Um, songbirds, you know, it's lovely hearing songbirds, seeing songbirds, but as an organic veg farmer, songbirds are a major part of my crop protection plan, you know. You know, every time I walk through my brassica crops, say cabbages, Brussels sprouts, whatever they are, they are always awash with songbirds, eating caterpillars, eating slugs, eating snails. The lovely beetle on the right, that's a ground beetle. So these are the number one predator of slugs and slug eggs, another huge challenge for organic horticulture. Bottom left, so that's a, a bee visiting some cherry blossom. Obviously pollination, a really important part of um, organic veg production, in fact, any veg production. You know, a lot of crops rely on pollination. I think at least a third of all human crops require um, insect pollination. And then the bottom two pictures, that's a lacewing and a hoverfly. Now these are my insecticides as an organic veg farmer. These are predatory insects. They will, if you nurture their habitats and give them somewhere really healthy to live, these really will look after all your pest species. 
uh, and the trees will provide a fantastic habitat for all of these. So it's not just a question of being charitable to wildlife by bringing in trees. It's actually, um, these are all key tools as a competitive organic veg grower. Um, we've got a very well established education project on the farm in lots of different ways. Um, we've got a preschool nursery. Uh, we've got a residential education um, set up that we take inner city kids from London and Bristol, uh, York, Manchester, they come and visit. They stay on the farm, they learn all about food production. I've got a team of a, a rolling team of apprentices I'm permanently training. Uh, we engage with lots of universities. We actually train soil association inspectors on site as well. So um, there's lots of public engagement. We felt the trees would just be another, uh, um, you know, another arm in this, um, in our complex, diverse, fantastic teaching tool. Um, and last, but by no means least, visual impact. This is the view uh, out the front of our cafe across the veg production fields. Uh, there's actually a veranda with tables on it. People sit there, uh, they have their lunch, they have coffees, and they look over this field. In the spring, there's loads of fantastic blossom from the trees. In the autumn, there's loads of fantastic color from the trees. Uh, and it just greatly enriches the customer experience, basically. So those were all the reasons or all the benefits we thought we could gain from the trees. So when it came to choosing the trees, these are the sort of uh, the remits that defined our choice. So you must deliver on our aims. So the aims were wind protection, soil health, fruit crops, wood chip production, biodiversity and visual impact. They must work on our soil type. So we're on Cotswold brush. That's a very shallow, you know, in most places we've got 20 centimeters of topsoil, then we're straight into the rock. Um, it's just very shallow, it's very stony, right up through the soil profile, stones all the way up. And it's a generally quite a high pH. We're on limestone, so we average between 7.5 and 8 on the pH scale. So that doesn't suit all trees. You know, an example of that is sweet chestnut. Uh, it'd be great to be able to sell chestnuts uh, through the shop. Um, they're a lovely timber species, a great coppice species. Um, but they really don't like high pH. So that's one of the ones we left out for that reason. And the trees must fit with intended location. So the intended location was mixed rotational horticultural cropping. So we wanted to avoid very heavy shaders. We wanted to avoid extensive shallow rooters. We wanted to avoid trees that excessively sucker like blackthorn. We wanted to avoid lots of very thirsty trees. Um, we'd seen some evidence from a project in the UK, research evidence from Wakelands, where he had short rotation willow next to his potato production. And in drought years, he had a, he noticed significant drop in yield uh, uh, next to the willow for his potatoes. And he suspected that it was the willow robbing water from the potato crop. So we were just wary of trees that were too thirsty. Uh, and the last uh, remit was must be a diverse mix of native trees. Now this was part of the grant stipulation from the Woodland Trust. But it's also the best habitat for UK wildlife. You know, UK natural trees will be the greatest habitat for UK natural insects, essentially, uh, and birds. You know, they're already there. We're just trying to encourage them deeper into our uh, cropping areas. And also, native trees grow best in our climate at the moment. There is an argument that as the climate change happens, they maybe need to sort of relook at what we consider to be UK trees. But for the moment, we went with native. So, big part of the plan, as I said at the beginning, was producing top fruit for the shop, basically. So apples being the major part of that. A few plums, a few cooking apples, some green gauges, but dessert apples was the mainstay of the production. Um, I grow a lot of crops. I've never grown commercial apple crops. It's a big subject in itself. So the first thing we did is we seek really good, high quality professional advice. Uh, and there's two kinds of advice we wanted. We wanted advice from signing really, really new apple trees. And that was Kevin O'Neill at Walcott Organic Nursery, which is not too far up the road uh, in Evesham from here. Um, and then the other thing we were really, we're really keen on, you know, we're a commercial food producer. We didn't want to grow lots of just heritage apple trees for the sake of it. We were actually more interested in growing apple trees that work really well in a commercial organic production setup. So we went to a commercial organic orchard and spent the day there with Rachel, Rachel and Martin Sobel up in Herefordshire 
and they gave us an amazing day and some critical commercially focused advice on organic apples. Um, the aim of the apple production plan is to keep the shop in continuous supply of apples from August until March. The maths, the shop requires an average of 100 kilos of apples per week. On average, one tree of at full maturity will give you 50 kilos of apples a year. Due to the exposed windy site, the shallow soil type and not spraying, we assume 25% less marketable yield than, than the 50 kilo figure. We wanted to hit a supply period of 37 weeks. Um, so that is basically from when the first apples become available in a UK climate, right through to the maximum sort of storage length for apples, you know, low tech storage for apples, um, which we deem to be sort of end of February, mid-March. So we worked out from that that we required uh, an apple yield of 3,700 kilos. We could see we'd get that off about 98 to 100 trees with full seasonal succession built in and storage being a key part of the plan. Pest and disease, where all varieties were selected, are all selected for scab resistance, which is a big issue in organic uh, apple production. Uh, we, we won't use any sprays and we'll rely on our great natural predator populations. You know, we're a 30 year old organic farm, so we're well down the road on having complex ecosystems, having not used any insecticide in over 30 years. Um, so this is the plan we came up with. So it's 13 varieties of apples. Um, and if you notice that, you know, as we go down through those varieties, that's the beginning of the seasons, that's the succession we're looking at. Down towards the bottom, you can see the numbers are bumped up towards the, bo the bottom in the numbers of trees. And that is the focus on storage. So, you know, really, when we're selling apples in December, January, February, and into March, all those apples are going to come out of storage. So yeah, we, we got really into the subject of storage and picking good apple varieties for storage. Um, so that's that's the top fruit selection. Um, like we said, we had two aims. We wanted to produce a lot of wood chip and a lot of top fruit. So the top fruit that's dealt with, um, wood chip production. Now this area, I, I had a lot of expertise in. You know, I, I worked as a coppice worker for three or four years. Um, I, I've, I've coppiced a lot of hazel, I've coppiced a lot of alder, I've coppiced a lot of willow. So I know how they behave. Uh, I've already got a, an affinity with these trees. So um, the really interesting thing here is we're, what we're basically talking about is a biomass crop to produce uh, compost and ramiel wood chip. Um, the interesting bit of research we came across is that if you look over a 20 year period, you know, willow is famous as being a biomass crop. Uh, it grows really, really fast. You know, you can coppice it every three years. But if you look over a 20 year period, you actually get the same biomass out of hazel coppice, alder coppice, and willow coppice. Although the willow grows much faster and you get more cuts out of it in 20 years, it's a much lighter wood. The hazel and the alder are much denser and heavier, so you actually get the same amount of biomass over a long period. The other really key uh, swinger on this is that willow is a particularly thirsty crop and will suck the moisture out of the surrounding area. Now, alder can grow well in, in wet areas, but it's nothing like as thirsty and water demanding as willow can be. So actually we went for wood chip production. We actually went for hazel and alder. We've got a little bit of willow mixed in as well, but the mainstay of the wood chip production is hazel and alder. Um, so just a quick little word on ramiel wood chip, if you, have, if you don't know what this is. So this is becoming more and more uh, talked about in uh, English organic veg production. Ramiel chipped wood is fresh, uncomposted wood chip made from small diameter material. Uh, and it is, it's spread immediately onto living cover crops. So this picture here, this is at Tolhurst Organics uh, uh, near Oxford. He's been doing long-term trials with the Organic Research Centre on using ramiel wood chip and the effects it's having. And the results we're seeing so far are very, very positive. Now he's done a bit of consultancy on uh, the farm where I work for a number of years. So we were naturally interested and have just sort of followed up on the work he's been doing. Um, and it's showing that it, it boosts soil life and fertility. It maintains soil organic matter levels and it also sequesters carbon. Um, and what we were interested in doing is we're gonna chip the coppice trees, use some of it to make compost for propagation, but a lot of it we were gonna save the time of making compost and applying that to the land we're just going to apply it straight to the land onto the cover crops. And I'm going to talk about how we factor in the rotation and the coppice cycle as well, actually. 
uh, in a little bit. So half, just over half the hardwood trees we put in were all for wood chipping. The other half of the hardwood trees we were going to put in were basically, if you remember, they're for visual impact, they're for wildlife um, uh, and for education as well. And if we can get some secondary crops for the cafe in the shop, then fantastic. So the other trees we chose to put into the system were wild cherry, elder, white willow, spindle and pussy willow. Now I could talk about these trees for ages because there's so many benefits with them, but I'm just going to quickly give a, a few benefits of each. So wild cherry, fantastic blossom, attracts in pollinators early in the year. Uh, the cherries, we get good cherry crops here on our wild cherries. Uh, great for wildlife, feed the birds, get the birds in amongst the crops. Elder, fantastic early, well, relatively early blossom. Uh, we can use the elder to make cordial for the cafe. Um, and it's a fantastic insect attractant tree for getting those pollinators and predators into our veg areas. The willows, now there's a lot of research in the UK going on with using willow wood chip to mulch apple trees as a defence against scab. Particularly pussy willow or goat willow, that has a very good stimulation effect on apple trees. It stimulates their own defence mechanisms against apple scab. So we put a lot of this in, and it's also one of the first blossoming trees in the UK. Comes kind of the same time as blackthorn or just after. So again, great for getting early insects into our cropping areas. And then spindle down the bottom, a lesser known tree, but it grows very well around where we're farming. Um, and this is an interesting one. So this is a real attractor of aphids, which you think would be a bad thing. But, you know, there's two ways this can work. It can be a trap crop next to the vegetable crop. So the aphids go onto the spindle rather than the vegetables. But the key philosophy for me is where there's aphids, the predators will come. So in, in a way, we use aphids to bring in the predators. If you don't have any aphids, you won't have any predatory insects. So we like seeing aphids around because it brings those, those predators into the cropping areas. So considerations for the layout of the planting. So it's horticultural cropping. Um, so we wanted a north to south aspect to allow minimum shading of the horticultural crops. Vegetables are a bit different to pasture. There's a lot of talk yesterday about how the effect of sunlight on pasture is not as great as everyone thinks. There is a great effect of shade on vegetable cropping. You know, it's, it's not, we don't want any shade, but we want to be tactical about where that shade is. So a north to south aspect is quite important. Uh, rotation, so it was logical to use an alley cropping system and we're going to use, you know, our alleys are essentially our rotational cropping areas, so we're going to split up our rotation areas with the tree lines. Um, windbreak effect, so this was the main aim for the trees, is to break that wind. Um, we, uh, with a bit of further research, it, it was apparent from a lot of different projects that basically the windbreak effect is 10 times the height of the trees. So if we take a lot of these coppice trees to get to about five meters and the apple trees get to about five meters, uh, we want those um, alleys to be about 50 meters apart to maximize that windbreak effect. The maths governing the layout. So we have a whole system approach here. So we, we try and make everything integrate, you know, the size of our beds for cropping, the irrigation system, the protection systems. So we, we work on a one and a half meter bed width. Our irrigation boom is 11 beds wide. It's just over 100 meters long. Our crop meshes are 100 meters long and four to three beds wide, depending on how tall the crops are. So the whole layout is going to take all this into, into account. Irrigation. So the ability to irrigate tree crops simultaneously with vegetable crops, particularly important with young trees and especially fruit trees. We wanted to make allowances for increasing spread of trees. So efficient use of space needs to adapt with the age of the trees as their canopy and their rooting area increases. And then something that's not talked about often enough is planning the understory of the trees, especially in horticultural systems, planning that in advance and trying to establish it in advance. So we'll just look at a few photos of some of the examples of these. Um, so irrigation. So you can see there, that's my, we got a, an irrigation boom essentially that goes across the field and irrigates the crops. That is... That's taken a few days ago. That's onion sets we've just put in. And if you can see, the boom is over the onion sets. We've actually got a tap on the end of that boom we can open up and it can water the tree crops and the understory crop as it comes down watering the onions. So we're watering the new tree plantings and the vegetable crops at the same time, which is very efficient. Um, increasing spread of trees. So uh, you can see here, I've got, you know, this is a three-year-old planting here. 
when we first plant the trees, they go in, in a one and a half meter wide veg bed. At three years, that's now three meters wide, that strip. And at full maturity, we're expecting that to be four and a half meters wide. Now, when we get to full maturity, we expect the cropping to still sit within one bed either side. And something that's not mentioned in silver pasture, because it's not so important, but with horticultural cropping, you do have to manage the roots of the trees. And what we find is we plough either side of these trees and we plough at 20 centimetres. Most veg crops are very, very shallow rooting. So the plough acts as a root pruning mechanism and it pushes the roots of the trees down and below and underneath most of our vegetable crops. Um, Understory. So we're, we're on the Cotswolds. We've got fantastic wildflowers here and we're really lucky to have that. And so we're, we're making adva taking advantage of that. And actually what we've used as the understory for the trees is um, wildflower mix underneath the trees. So these trees are heavily mulched. So they've got their own little kind of weed free area. But then we've got these fantastic insects populations that come in into these wildflower strips. You can see that lovely crop of brassicas behind. So, you know, that's potentially got loads of aphids in it. It's got loads of uh, cabbage white caterpillars in it. But in this wildflower strip, there'll be loads of hoverflies, loads of parasitic wasps, and they just graze out over those brassicas uh, and just hoover up. You know, they're a fantastic insecticide, predatory insects. So this is the actual final layout we worked out. So we've got a dark green strips, uh, the, the, the tree strips, um, with the undersown perennial wildflowers. We then have nine beds of horticultural cropping. That's one boom width of the irrigator. Um, and then we've got three of those boom widths between the tree areas with two annual wildflower strips. And that just, in the high winds, those annual wildflower strips, again, more insects in amongst the cropping, but they just give us a bit of a buffer, depending on what the wind direction is, with drift from the boom, like the water drifting in the wind. So it just allows us to be really targeted with the watering. So this is how the trees are going to be split up. So we've got apple trees, one every 28 metres, five metres space on either side of the apple trees, and then we're into the hardwoods. And you can see there, we've got coppice species, wildlife species, coppice species, wildlife species, three metres between these trees. Even when we're doing the coppicing, we're still going to be leaving those wildlife trees up, and they'll, they'll be providing all those benefits all the time, no matter what stage of the coppice we're at. This is the layout of the field. So it's a five year vegetable rotation, uh, and that is two years of fertility building, clover crop, um, and then it's uh, mixed brassicas, uh, and then it's mixed main crop alliums, so leeks, red onions, and white onions. Uh, and then at the end of the rotation, we do a mix of uh, main crop beetroots uh, for storage, uh, winter squash for storage, and our sweet corn crops. And then back round for another two years of fertility, and round we go. Um, so how you integrate your rotation and your coppicing is a really interesting subject, especially with horticulture. And we, I put quite a bit of time into working out the, the integration between coppice timing and where, what point of the rotation we're in. This is actually called phasing. Uh, and this is a, a tiny little graph just showing that the age, and this is coppice, um, hazel coppice we're talking about here. So you can see the height on the left, and you can see the, year, the age of the coppice along the bottom. Now we're on a five year rotation. You can see that that five year old coppice gets up to sort of five, six meters. So if I run you through the rotation, so rotation year one, uh, this is with a full height, six meters of coppice downwind, uh, sorry, upwind of the cropping area. So preventing that wind. Now we like, you think, why do I want a windbreak when I'm trying to establish a fertility build? Well, actually, we establish our fertility builds in like, as I'd say, generally these days, like late April, early May. Like I said, we're into drought quite often by that time of the year. Uh, dropping that wind speed, having a big wind break, aids us to um, establish really good fertility crops. Now, it's really important for us, our fertility crops. We must establish them. You know, we don't use anything else for fertility, just the fertility crops. So we've got to have really competitive, really fertile fertility crops to... Um, outcompete weeds and feed the rest of the rotation. So we've got a windbreak that aids us establish those fertility crops. Year two, we've got established fertility. So this is when we cut down the coppice and apply it as ramiel wood chip to the fertility crop, like I spoke about earlier. You always apply ramiel uh, wood chip to a living crop because the soil just eats it up then. Uh, and then 
we don't need a windbreak for an established fertility crop. So there's no windbreak at this point. Year three, mixed brassicas, we're up to, we're up to the first sort of year of growth on the coppice then. Um, so up to about three meters by the end of the year as we go into winter, which helps just protect the taller crops like kale and Brussels sprouts from being rocked around by winter winds. Um, fourth year of the rotation, we're into alliums. So alliums don't need much wind protection for the crop, but they cast no shade and there's a lot of evaporation of water from the ground with allium crops. So the four meter high coppice will provide good wind break and stop that water evaporation. Year five, so year five, you know, this is where our, as far as vegetable cropping is concerned, we're our highest wind break. Sweet corn, we saw in the picture at the beginning, can get flattened by wind. Winter squash absolutely hates wind. If you have a really windy year, you don't get a good squash crop. And then interestingly, beetroot, main crop beetroot for storage. Well, this is one of the last crops I sow in the summer. And the clue there is summer. I tend to sow this in mid to late June. Now we're hot and dry by then. Again, the wind protection is going to keep that evaporation down and it help me to establish this beetroot crop. And then that just kept, carries on round. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's how the coppice works with the rotation. Uh, sort of slides out here. So this was the, um, this is the time lapse on the project. So year one, spring, thousand, two, spring 2017, we reorientate the field while applying for a grant uh, and doing further planning and research. Autumn 2017, we plough, cultivate and establish the understory. Early spring 2018, we plant the first 50 apple trees while waiting for the grant approval. Um, we pay for these ourselves, we just wanted to get going and start establishing and practicing our techniques. Um, autumn 2018, we received the grant approval, prepare the next understory strips and then spring 2019, we plant the remaining apple trees, 200 hardwoods. Year four in the autumn, Early rains prevent establishment of understory for next plantings. That's just farming. Uh, spring 2020, plant the remaining hardwoods. And that is that was the field all planted up. Uh, a few other things I wanted to cover. So protecting the trees. So for the apple trees, the major protection aim was against deer and rabbits. So again, we start with, there's a lots of expensive options for protection, but we just went for stock netting. Got lots of it on farm, gets... Um, on the livestock side, it gets replaced every sort of eight, nine, 10 years when it starts gets a bit trashed. But we were recycling a lot of that into tree guards. Um, we then, rabbits as well are a big problem and hares. So all the apple trees have got a spiral guard inside that stock net and guard. Um, we're pruning the apple trees up high in order to get them out of the browsing range of roe deer. Um, and then once they're mature, the pitch on the right, we get rid of the stock net guards we switch to tree guards to prevent ring barking and enable ease of pruning and mulching. And then on the hardwood varieties, deer and rabbits, again, we use plastic tree guards and copper species when cut will be piled with a bit of the brash and that stops the rabbits getting in and eating stuff. Voles are becoming more and more of a problem, but as more birds of prey come into the system, we hope this will kind of offset that. Um, weed control and tending. Wood chip mulch applied every February, tree guards removed and trees weeded every February. February also when I check protection and prune the fruit trees. Irrigation, incredibly important. Risky to rely on rain in current climate. Very lucky this was part of original planning. It's still been a problem though when young trees are next to fertility crops. I wouldn't normally be running boom across the fertility crops in the height of summer, but I've had to do that just to watering the young apple plantings. Um, don't risk late spring plantings, very susceptible to drought loss. So plans for the future, uh, more trees? Well, definitely. I've got another whole field scale area that we haven't started in yet. Uh, we've got the market garden. We haven't, we, we're kind of toying around with whether we put trees in there. But the most important focus, I think, actually, is just to bed in the system we've already put in um, and see how we get on with that and learn the lessons few mistakes here and there, uh, just iron those out and just like refine our systems. Um, we just put up a thousand meter square glass house and we are definitely looking at bringing agroforestry inside the glass house. So we're, we're looking at using, um, you know, again, three dimensional cropping, extend our production lines, so more tender fruit, so peaches and nectarines. We'll grow them down, you see the steel uprights in the middle of this photo. Well, what we're going to do is train, fan train peaches and nectarines down these bays uh, and grow them up, kind of up and above the vegetable crops in there. Um, uh, and that's the front view of the glasshouse. Now, wind is definitely not a problem in the glasshouse. However, when the 
contractors who built it left. They said, oh, we'll see you in the summer when you ring us up to come and put in a shading system. Now, that got me thinking, you know, it is getting hotter and sunnier and sunnier. And actually, it will be shading we use agroforestry for. So deciduous fruit inside, deciduous climbers outside, it would provide shading in the summer and not affect valuable light in the winter. And then the last thing I want to say is timber crops, established coppice and nut crops are all an investment for the future. You know, some of them for me when I'm an old man, some of them for my children if they take over the growing operation. But without a doubt, positive impact on biodiversity is almost instantaneous. Birds will perch on branches, insects will feed on blossom, and fungal networks will develop in the soil within the first year. And in fact, the top left, that insect there, that is on one-year-old pussy willow, and that kestrel is on one-year-old cherry tree. They come in, you know, make the space in the habitat, and the wildlife will just come in straight away. Um, and the fungal networks underneath the trees, well, we can't see them, but we know they're there and they're developing fast and bringing all the benefits that we know they bring to soil. And that is the end of my presentation. So um, I hope that's interesting and uh, I'd love to take some questions. Thank you, Andy. That was, that was absolutely brilliant. Um, really interesting to see what you've established there. And, and also really nice to hear about biodiversity because we, we didn't talk a huge amount about it yesterday. Uh, so it was, it was great. We've got obviously loads of questions for you. So I'm going to crack on with them. We've got about eight minutes to get through them. So if you can be fairly brief in your answer. Yeah, we'll do. We'll <laughs> Thank do. you. Um, Emer, how did you get the understory wildlife, uh, wildflower strip established? Do you cut it back in autumn? I'm struggling to establish wildflowers. So we, um, what we do is say, I, I take a quite a long term view. I mean, it's like with any vegetable crop, if you get it in well and competitively at the beginning, uh, you reap the benefits for years to come. So it, but I kind of, it's very important to plan this into the sequence of how you do this. So in a quick sort of snapshot, what I do is where I was going to put in the trees, I basically weeded those strips for the whole of the summer previously. In the autumn, I then sowed the wildflower mix late in the autumn. That's when wildflowers seed naturally. They then get watered in all the way through the winter and then it was late winter, we planted the trees into those already seeded wildflower strips. And then we just let them take their course. We don't do any management, no cutting, no removal. We just let them go through their own evolution as a wildflower strip. Then. That's interesting. And a low fertility being the key thing as well, I presume there. Yes, and that, that weeding the year beforehand will drop that fertility. Um, has Andy noticed any nitrogen fixing benefits from the alders with vegetable crop production? So not yet, no. I mean, it's a young crop, they're three years old. I, I wouldn't really expect to see that advantage yet. And, and we've got, obviously, nitrogen fixing is our main source of fertility. So to discern the difference between the alder and the effects of the clover in the rotation would be a tricky one. Um, what was the time scale to reach profitable sales on apple alleys? Okay, so we, we looked into this. So it's, we reckon we were advised 10 years. After 10 years, we should be expecting to hit those... Um, those sort of commercial yields that we're hoping for. So it's a relatively long game. Um, what size is Ramiel wood chip and does it matter if the wood chip comes from conifer or hardwood species? Okay, so Ramiel wood chip is basically they say between four inches, 10 centimeters and under. And the, the importance of that is that is the most, it, whether it be small branches on the tree or short rotation coppice, what you're trying, you want live wood. You don't want heartwood. So big old bits of trunk and no good. You want young branches, and that is where 75% of all the amino acids and enzymes in a tree are in that living wood, not in the heartwood, and that's where all the goodness is. So that, that's the trees you want. So coppice, and as far as I'm aware, pine is fine. As long as you get the right-sized wood and a good mix of species, you will get the benefits from it. Uh, some of these questions are slightly doubling up on what you said, but I'll put them to you anyway. And um, What are the main tree species you find can grow well with vegetables or uh, are there particular types of vegetables you find go well with particular species of trees? No, I mean, I, like, like I say, I grow 80 different uh, vegetable and fruit crops. My attitude to trees is exactly the same. As an organic farmer, diversity is absolutely key. It, whatever it is, whether it's trees or vegetables, vast monocrops, for me, equal problems. You know, problems accelerate and proliferate fast in a monocrop. So whatever we're doing, we try and keep a really good diverse mix of species. 
So on that note, the next question, I presume uh, I can guess what the answer is, but what size blocks of apple trees would be ideal in an agroforestry setting, 20 by 20? And would it be better to plant separate blocks of pear, plum and apple varieties or mix them in the same blocks? Thank you. I, I mean, I, yeah, I, I would say mix them. Uh, I think there was some chat yesterday about uh, from Ben Raskin about how mm. apple scab was delayed mm. by mixing your varieties of trees. And, you know, whatever your pest problems are, uh, any the diversity again of diversity of habitat for your protection species of insects but also diversity of habitat just to, as a break against disease as well and i'm mindful of the scale that you're operating at andy and i'm thinking of over here with the smaller sized farm so we'll take you know 30 acres or five acres or whatever does it does it still work on a smaller scale what you're saying yeah i i think the benefits are there whatever you know the benefits of sticking one apple tree on an allotment will bring in uh, the, the same benefits to an allotment scale as putting in a vast kind of like, even up to arable kind of veg crops like potatoes, you know, up to sort of 30 acre fields, bringing into um, trees into whatever scale you'll see benefits. Uh, you touched on this a bit, but is there an issue with the roots of trees interfering with the growth of any vegetables? Yes, I think almost certainly. In uh, my market garden, there's um, ancient woodland at the bottom of the market garden and the bed's really close to that woodland. We don't plough in the market garden. It's all just sort of um, shallow depth power harrowing with walk behind tractors. We do have problems from tree roots coming into the market garden beds. So I think, and it's, it's interesting with regenerative farming being a big subject, I think the, um, the, the root pruning with vegetables is very important. Now, I know a lot of people are trying to move away from ploughs, I'm sure, you know, subsoiling just in the strip next to the trees. So it is important not, like I said, don't pick shallow rooters. And you, the good news is that most vegetable crops are very shallow rooted. So you, you haven't got to push the roots too far down. But if you do a no dig system, be a bit careful about how close you put those trees to a no dig bed because they'll, um, the roots will come up and into those no dig beds yeah. if you're not, not physically pruning them. That's great advice, yeah. Sean. Yeah, no, that was part of my, um, my going to be follow-on question, so you just answered there. I want to take you back to the, the blocks of apple trees, because uh, I think there's two parts to that question. Um, 20 metres by 20 metres, is that an ideal block? Is... So blocks, so we're, on, we're, we're literally in, in 100 metre long lines. So we're, we're very much alley cropping, so it's long straight trees, lo long straight lines of apple trees, rather than in blocks 20 by 20. Okay. And uh, there's a question here and somebody's querying because you mentioned uh, aiming for a closed system. How are you going to manage the produce sold off the farm because it exports minerals? Can closed systems work perpetually in this scenario as there are no off-farm inputs? So we're not, we, we don't, the, uh, my remit from my employer with the vegetables is we do not look to export any crops at all. All of our production is aimed to meet the demand of the cafe and the farm shop. Now, obviously, all farmers know that nailing your target amount exactly is impossible. In order to, to always project, provide enough crop, we slightly overproduce, you know, and then we have losses. We literally wholesale tiny amounts of farm just as glut management. But we really do target our production. So the veg is what we're on, um, six hectares of veg, and that is about what we need to farm to feed those 800 people all year round. And I think on that note, the final question is, what kind of inputs are keeping fertility for the horticulture production? How much of a closed loop have you managed to achieve? So we just, the, our, all our fertility, so uh, we do produce compost on, on site. We've got a cafe, so the food waste comes back from the cafe. We've got our, our packing shed, so we, we, where, we, where we strip leaves back on all our veg production. Uh, we have grayed out once we've harvested. All that stuff is composted, but actually the amount of Vegetable waste compost we make is just about enough to feed the glass houses, as well the glass house and the polytunnels. Um, out, outside market garden and field scale, that is all cover crop based, yeah. so all clover based fertility. Essentially a stock free system. All right, Andy, it's four o'clock, so we're going to have to wrap it up. Thank you so much for joining us. It's just fascinating. How can people follow your, your work or your progress? So if you, I mean, the organic farm shop, uh, you'll, if you type into a search engine, that's, um, yeah, we've got regular diaries, garden diaries on there. Um, and I do a little bit through the Farm Ambassadors Programme for the Soil Association. 
and I pop up at conferences here and there throughout the UK. But yeah, go to the Organic Farm Shop website, Sarancester, and you can keep, uh, keep abreast of stuff there. Andy, thank you so much, and thanks, thanks. for answering the questions so well as well. And I, I think you're joining us next week, are you? I am, yeah, I yeah. look forward to it. Super. Yeah. Thanks, thanks again, Andy. Thanks, Andy. Great, thanks a lot, guys. Thanks for having me. Cheers.